So really excited to be here. On, um, no. Super excited to be here on this panel uh, with uh, five amazing leaders in this ecosystem. And really, what we're going to be looking at today is how do brands think about this next generation of technology, and how can they look to integrate it into their into the future of their mix? And then how how do we grapple with what's happening out there within uh, various, uh, within uh, the metaverse and do all roads lead to the metaverse? So I, I'd like to really um, kind of start us off with uh, introductions and uh, I'll start here, Dina Fierro. And uh, maybe I'll uh, just get you guys to quickly introduce yourselves uh, just uh, down the line. Sure, hi everyone, Dina Fierro, SVP of the Web3 and the Metaverse Group at Shiseido Americas. So I really oversee digitally innovative projects across our portfolio of prestige and luxury beauty brands. Um, I took on this role in January after really leading the charge at NARS Cosmetics in terms of our earliest experimentation uh, within the Metaverse and Web3. Hi everyone, Vera Chen. Um, uh, global corporate strategy and insights. Um, my team focuses on uh, leveraging research and analytics to really try to understand how consumers' tastes, habits, behaviors are evolving um, with respect to entertainment. Um, we also seek to look kind of around the corner uh, with what's evolving with consumers and sometimes around the corner from around the corner. Hi, um, I'm Adrian Wand, founder and uh, CEO of Trueverse. Uh, Trueverse is an immersive media platform or space for targeted for male audiences. In other words, we're reinventing and reimagining the world of a men's digital publishing in the metaverse. Hi, my name is uh, Kenneth Landau, uh, co-founder and CEO of Metaverse. Metaverse is a metaverse platform for enterprise uh, built on, on the Unreal Engine. Uh, for true to life and photorealistic uh, visuals of uh, your own metaverse um, using pixel streaming to help anyone from anywhere in the world to, ac to access the metaverse uh, and uh, uh, hardware agnostic so you can use any hardware to enter the metaverse, making it, making it very easy for anyone to access the metaverse. Dina, I want to start with you. Where are we at in this customer journey? Are we seeing consumers adopt VR, AR, spatial computing, immersive tech uh, technology? Or are, they, or are we still at the laggard period where they're still assessing where they want to go with the future of this technology? Hmm. Okay, so that's a very big question. It's like multiple questions kind of packaged into one. Um, I think that the answer is probably a little different if we look at different technologies and platforms. You know, I think that AR is sort of the easiest entry point when we think about a more immersive digital experience, whether that's happening online or in a physical environment. I think at this point, the vast majority of consumers around the world are entirely accustomed to engaging with AR, and it could even be considered kind of an always-on, you know, um, tool within the marketer's toolkit. Um, that said, I think that we're in the very earliest days of the metaverse, and we've even seen that, um, I think, reflected in some of the conversations here today. One of the things I consistently observe, and I find it kind of entertaining, to be quite honest, but I think that there's kind of a, a general lack of consensus around how we all respectively define the metaverse, even for people working in the space. So for me, put very simply, I really think about the metaverse, and I talk about the metaverse as the inevitable future of digital experience. It is more immersive, real-time, and interactive. Is it blockchain-based? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe some metaverses will be. Right, um, right now, no metaverses with scale are, are blockchain-based, that's for sure. Um, so, you know, from, from a Shiseido standpoint, we really look at platforms that have both scale um, and resonance to either our existing consumer or a consumer we might wish to target. And I think, um, you know, to, to Kenneth's point, actually, you know, we look to execute in environments that feel brand right and allow for um, a level of visual fidelity. And uh, I'll bring it to you, Kenneth. Uh, what, what are you seeing on the platform side? Are, are brands starting to adopt this technology and start to, starting to use this as part of their everyday mix? Well, the reality is what we're seeing when talking to large enterprise today is there are two constant on every conversation we have is 
Number one, they have no idea what the metaverse is when you talk to them. The second one is they know they have to be in it. So they're looking for ways to start the journey. The way we see it is that the metaverse today is a journey, not a destination. And companies are looking for a way to start and enter to be ready, just like when the internet started and then websites. A lot of companies said, I don't need a website. Well, every company in the world has a website today. And then they said, I'm not going to be selling on e-commerce. There's going to be too many challenges. I mean, like Dina said, the metaverse is just the next generation of the internet. It's where everything is going 2D, it's going to be 3D immersive. And companies are getting ready for that. Uh, consumers and consumers may not be ready yet to interact, but the ones that are not ready for sure are in the companies themselves. So they need to start going through the journey. And they're ready to start that journey. That's what we're seeing right now. Go ahead, if I can just add to that, I, I think it's a comment upon us, especially brands, um, creators, what have you, platform providers, um, to give consumers a reason to adopt it. I just don't know if all the pieces are together for mm -hmm. your average consumer to jump into this space. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of excluding the world. Robloxes, Fortnites, and, and uh, Minecrafts of the world uh, for a minute, but all the other kind of experience, we need to give them a reason, you know, whether it's through content, through the device, and all those things working together to provide a reason for why a consumer should shell out $500, $3,500, or spend an hour of their time towards a certain experience. Are there some learnings around Roblox and Fortnite? I think Roblox uh, just mentioned that they have 60 million daily users. Uh, where can we take that? And uh, is there lightning in a bottle that we can look at uh, in integrating with other brands and other uh, kind of ecosystem leaders to really look at this is where it, the this is where the puck is headed. Well, I think it's interesting because despite the fact that people like to talk about Roblox and Fortnite in the same sentence, they're entirely different platforms. Mm -hmm. They serve very different audiences. Yep. Roblox is a platform and an ecosystem of thousands and millions of experiences, many of which look very different from one another. Whereas Fortnite is really a singular experience, and the ways in which brands, for example, are able to activate within Fortnite are, are quite limited, if we're being honest with one another. That's not even getting into the nuance of how you bring traffic to your experiences within those respective platforms, which is also very, very different. Yeah. Um, I am not a big believer that every platform is for every brand. I think, to your point, which was very eloquently stated, you really, you know, there needs to be be kind of a, a purpose for the brand. There needs to be a purpose um, that you're serving on the platform to the community that exists there. You want your experience to be native to platform if you're expecting to see any degree of resonance and engagement. Um, that said, I do very much believe in the future of Roblox, um, not to mention the present. Um, we've activated activated actually on behalf of the NARS brand on platform twice with two limited experiences, once in 2022 and once earlier in 2023. They were both extraordinarily successful experiences that really validated a lot of our, our planned kind of future endeavors in this space. But that is um, to say that we executed in a way that was really intended to, you know, recruit new audiences to the brand, to gain mind share. Someone asked me a question last night at a related dinner to this event. Well, how are you measuring ROI? Is the Roblox user converting? You're not asking me the right question, if that's the question that you're asking me. You know, and I think that this comes back again to the point that you were making, Kenneth, around like companies who are preparing themselves. I think similarly, when we're engaging audiences in these platforms that are reaching Gen Alpha and Gen Z, um, depending on your brand, you need to be aware of whether that's a current consumer or an aspirational consumer. And you know, that isn't specific to the projects I've worked on. I think. I don't want to speculate on any other brand strategy, but that's you know very clearly sort of the approach that a Gucci is taking here. They know that they're not reaching a current Gucci consumer on Roblox. So they're they're sort of building up uh, that kind of user base right now and building up the consumer base and really educating them about what their future behaviors will look like. Right. Uh, Adrian, if if you're able to sort of kind of chime in on that and what you're yeah. seeing from the content side of things. Yeah, I think if you're working with brands, I think there are different ways of looking at them, right? Brands are, you have on one hand, brands trying to build out audiences, right? And trying to say, they're putting a, a you know, a flag in the sand, if you will, um, trying to say we are in the metaverse. And then obviously starting to acquire audiences, even if there are young audiences. Um, so, and that's also a little bit of legacy 
um, I guess, approach to it. And what I mean by that is brands, for the most, for the most part, uh, rightly so, they're looking for la large scale audiences. So what, what's sort of the least amount of friction that has today is these gaming platforms, for instance, right? That they already have built in audiences. The question is, do they have the right audiences? So then as a brand, you need to, from a strategy perspective, well, going back to Dina's point, it's like, we're building, right? The ROI that you're asking for is the wrong question to ask. You're trying to establish yourself, put a stake in the ground, and say we are in the metaverse right now. Now, from the model in terms of gaming, the reality is these are gaming platforms, right? And, and there are so many things that we can borrow and inform what the metaverse which, by the way, for us, I think we all <laughs> coincide on this, is immersive experiences. Let's simplify that for everybody in, in the lingo and the conversation. These are immersive experiences that will craft how we consume content, regardless of what that is, products and services. As a matter of fact, we're, you know, now we're coining, it's not e-commerce anymore, it's i-commerce immersive commerce. So starting to think in those terms, I think brands, it's easier for brands to start identifying and moving their thinking from Web 2 to Web 3. It's much easier to digest the idea of immersive, which puts one sort of, um, one scenario, right, easy to digest concept and rather this idea of the metaverse. Vera, you, you really uh, get the sexy job of uh, gathering the data and really consuming it and, and really understanding some of the future behaviors uh, that um, your, you know, folks at Warner Brothers are looking at and what they're looking at to integrate in, into the future. So can you, can you really uh, give us a viewpoint on what you're seeing, what, um, what uh, data sets that you're seeing around uh, some of this future technology, and is it are we still a, a little while away, or are we almost there? Yeah, so um, I will certainly try to talk about that. A lot of more of my work kind of focuses on when consumers and how they're looking um, at in the future. But um, you know, we just came off of, uh, and I see some of my colleagues here, an, an internal event where we were right looking at different startups and other you know um, inventors who are coming to uh, the table and you know matching up with different business units internally to help solve different um, kind of issues. Some of them do involve uh, metaverse-like experiences, others involve Gen AI, um, you know, but they are all, all of them collectively trying to um, kind of help uh, facilitate either back-end processes on the, in, in, in our, you know, different businesses to um, also f consumer facing ones, you know, so leveraging all these different type of technologies. Um, so that's one end. Um, from our own actual research with consumers, um, I think we have a, a, a fairly good understanding of what consumers are looking for. We did a, a body of work to help uncover there's about seven core needs consumers are looking for in metaverse like experiences. Um, so I think that's a great foundation for us to start building on. You know, one of those needs, for example, is that, you know, the whatever experiences we do create um, at Warner Brothers Discovery has to kind of level up existing experience. So it simply cannot be a replica of something you can do in real life or in another game or website. There's got to be some, some action, some motive, some, you call it gaming mechanics if you want, um, in it. So that's just one of like the learnings too. Um, and then just going back to your earlier question around what are some like learnings across these different platforms that consumers are looking for, there's really, I mean, these are a little bit no duh, but you know, one of them is certainly um, offering consumers a lot of customization possibilities. So whatever your experience is, if you're targeting um, Gen Z and Gen Alpha, for example, please offer a lot of customers. They, they want to personalize and express themselves. The an another one is to constantly refresh and update your experience. Don't just throw it on there and let it, let it happen. You need to obviously market, drive people there, but beyond that, you need to have a roadmap for what you are doing to update the experience through um, DLC, through, you know, map packs, through, you know, season, seasons, what have you. You need to constantly update to get them to come back and continue engaging in your experience. One, adding to data analytics and how we gather data, uh, we believe that the metaverse will be, will be the best collector of data for marketers in the history. I mean, it's, uh, it's like having the best of every world. I mean, you have someone coming in. We have a beta 
customer that did a POC in the car manufacturing industry that they ask us to put a stroller in the floor outside the car, outside the trunk, and golf clubs and a car seat to see what customers, what people were placing inside the trunk. Now imagine what, a, what they can do with that data to go back to these customers and say, hey, you looked at this car, you put a stroller in the back. We have these three models that will be great for family. And if the person sat on the back seat or in the front seat, and if they turn on the TV on the back, we have great cars for you. So again, the data that you can capture when you're inside these type of engines is an immense amount of data that you can actually use to go back to your customers with meaningful information. And that's actually pretty powerful. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, Vera, you must be super excited with uh, you know, security. the uh, amount of data that we're going to be able to collect on users, especially as uh, more and more folks get involved in this frontier technology. Um, Adrian, I want, I want to kind of bring it back to you on uh, the content side of things. I see a lot of uh, brands out there uh, you know, testing out VR and AR and uh, immersive technology, but you know they're throwing money at these uh, experiences, and all it does is you know collect dust. Uh, you know, they might deploy it for a few weeks, and then it'll collect dust on the shelf somewhere, or the experiences will just be really, really bad. Um, how can we ensure that um, you know, you know, as you're working with uh, cons uh, customers and brands that you kind of go through that process of education and really asking them the question, why do this in uh, the metaverse and and what is the main reason behind this? And um, just give me an, an insight on how you guys talk to your customers. Yeah. Well, by the way, the, the uh, sort of the challenges that you just mentioned are very real. <laughs> so there are technology issues related to building up metaverses, whether it's power, uh, computing power, right? That sometimes is not sufficient to really power high fidelity experiences. There is delay. We all, all wire. We have basically nobody has patience anymore, number one. So a lot of things is they want to have very similar experience from the user perspective and also from the brands. They want immediacy. They want they want to have a high fidelity, photorealistic, really well built out environments that move at the speed of just a simple HTML based website. So changing that mindset right now at these stages today, right? Because we're building out this thing so called the metaverse. So one thing is brands need to be a little bit patient. Um, Going back to your question in terms of doing one-offs, right? One-off activations. If you're a brand there, you really want to sort of put your stick in the ground and say we are or we're building on the metaverse. This is a long-term commitment. It doesn't serve any brand. Um, not only you have to have the means and you know the funding and all that <laughs> to do that, but it doesn't serve anything to just show up in one activation. You just you cannot build an audience. I mean, we have to, as a point of reference, let's think about when brands were activating first in social media, right? The time it took for those brands to really build an audience in social media. It still happens today. If you open up a YouTube channel, it will take some time. This is not any different. But what's even worse right now is the, um, the adoption level at the same time. So not only you have a lack of awareness, people are still trying to figure out what the metaverse is. So that's why I'm saying we need to simplify what experience we're selling, what you, the experience that you're selling as a brand to your consumers, but the experience that we're selling to um, basically to your consumers as well. Um, so simplify it, make it an immersive experience, commit. This is now brands go by calendars, right? They do one month activation, they buy media for a week, uh, or they do temples. You need to spend the time, build your team, build your immersive storytelling and which means a lot of things for, for different brands. And uh, Dina, bringing it back to you from the brand perspective, do uh, you think uh, as a brand, sometimes uh, you have to really look at yourself in the mirror and, and look at your budget and look at uh, what you want to do and look at the goal that you're trying to attain? And does it sometimes mean not doing VR, AR, or immersive experiences? And um, you, know, you were one of the first uh, uh, adopters of augmented reality cosmetics and really um, being a pioneer in, on that side with NARS Cosmetics. Uh, so, so sometimes is it on the brand to really look at 
um, not doing something when when it's just all supposedly flashy and, and trying to get attention? I mean, I think it depends on the brand and their respective objectives. I know that's a deeply annoying answer. But, um, you know, there are brands, and, and Alice Delahunt was just on stage, who it's always such a pleasure to hear her speak, but, you know, she spent many years at Burberry, and, and Burberry was a brand that repositioned itself from this, like, boring, staid luxury player into a, a brand that was much more cutting edge and relevant, um, you know, in the earliest days of social media. Um, so I do think that there is sort of a first mover advantage that, that Adrian was kind of mentioning a bit here. Um, when we think about more immersive digital environments, there is an opportunity to not only like stake a claim and to gain mind share with new audiences, but also to actually use some of these technologies in a thoughtful way to tell a compelling brand story. And that can all contribute to sort of a broader repositioning of a brand. So that, I think, is very powerful. Um, you know, there are obviously some brands that have much more um, healthy innovation budgets, and so they're able, perhaps, to activate in spaces and to use technology without necessarily any expectation of scale or ROI. But for most marketers working at most consumer brands, particularly in this economy, I do think that you have to be strategic. Um, you have to know who you are and kind of the experience that you're hoping to create. And you also need to be aware of sort of either the technology and the consumer it's reaching or the platform and the audience that is already engaged. Great answer. Uh, so we've been talking here uh, about what's happening in the metaverse right now and how brands are sort of grappling uh, with the present day. But I want to bring it into the future. And uh, Kenneth, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, who are the uh, influencers of the future? And, you know, looking at Gen Z and Gen Alpha, we're already starting to see what the user behaviors will look like, but what will they look like in the metaverse? Well, I think it goes back to the fact that uh, younger generations today, they know how to navigate 3D immersive game engines. I mean, let's start there. Uh, we have customers that we clearly know the age of the person when they come in for a demo or we go in for supporting one of their events because you, they start running around and they start using the platform for what, it, what it's intended for. So now, I mean, the, the future, what the future is looking is, uh, in my opinion, is we're going to a 3D immersive world where when you cannot be face to face, you're going to be experiencing the world instead of on a 2D screen on a 3D immersive screen. And you're gonna to need to be doing e-commerce, you're gonna be buying, you're gonna fall into a store instead of going to a website to make a purchase. And uh, I think that in five to seven years, you're gonna start seeing that more and more and more. And uh, it has to be accessible, has to be easy to use. Um, but the reality is that we're getting used to that in generations right now that are using this technology they know how to navigate it and use it. So what we're seeing right now is large corporations understanding that. And uh, what's amazing to me is that while we're having conversations with marketing departments and HR departments to adopt our technology, now we're seeing the traction with technology and innovation because they already have teams building. I mean, they have content creators for 3D in their organizations. They don't know how to deploy that into the metaverse. They're already thinking on how to build their 3D immersive experience, single player, and looking for platforms to deploy that in the metaverse. And so I think that's what the future is bringing is companies building their own experience, deploying it in the metaverse, and then building their own ecosystem to bring their audience together. If I can just add one point to that, I think that very much agree that you know the future of the quote unquote metaverse it's it's much less about spectatorship and much more about participation mm -hmm. and i'm going to use another deeply annoying buzzword that i'm sure other people have used on stage today and that is co-creation and the reality is that every brand and every organization is going to have to become much more comfortable with their consumer, their audience, becoming an active participant in the brand mm -hmm. and potentially in the creation of those experiences. Um, and so one of the things that I find so fascinating was actually one of the best unlocks from one of our earliest forays into the metaverse in 2021, which was on Zepetto. Um, if anyone is familiar, Zepetto is probably one of the most scaled metaverse ecosystems in APAC. It's owned by Naver, which is the parent company of Line in Korea. 
Um, so in Zepetto, we activated, you know, a pretty simple project where we were, we had um, a series of mini activations called photo and video boosts that were branded environments for user generated content creation. And then we also introduced a collection of virtual goods, branded merchandise and artistry looks. And I was like, all right, yeah, we'll, we'll do virtual goods. It's going to be fun. It's going to be cool. And um, we expected the the ROI really to be around the user generated content, which was indeed compelling. But the hugest surprise to me was that we saw, you know, sales of almost 900,000 virtual goods in a very limited time activation on that platform. And that was, by the way, that number is dwarfed by the number of virtual goods that we saw sold and redeemed in our 2022 Roblox experience, which was more than 22 million virtual goods sold and redeemed. And I think that for me, um, it's less about the revenue opportunity in terms of the point that I'm making here. And it's more about um, the entire ecosystem of creators within a platform like Roblox or within Epic's, for example, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. It's an entire economy that exists within exactly. those spaces. Yeah. And so brands are just one of the avenues for virtual goods creation. And instead, you have, I mean, there are literally teenagers who are making millions of dollars creating virtual goods on Roblox. Mm -hmm. It's pretty That's cool, right. and it's going to be incredibly disruptive. Yeah, absolutely. I can jump in on the um, the influencer you know side of the question too. Um, so you know if we put our foresight hats on, you know we know that it's going to be most likely Gen Alpha and then the generation after that who haven't been born yet uh, and whatever they're going to be called. Um, and so thinking through that lens, they're obviously going to be much more diverse, uh, much more intersectional, fluid in their identities. Um, and I don't believe that the future influencers in this space will be, um, they won't necessarily come from, let's say, North America. They won't necessarily speak English. Um, I think of uh, the TikTok star Kabi LeMay, I, I, I'm probably butchering his name, but to me, that is, uh, you know, the type of influencer that I do think we're going to see in the future in these kind of spaces. People who can, um, for him, taking TikTok and being able to tell his stories through that, we were going to get his equivalent in these metaverse spaces of people, Gen Alpha and, and later on, who can use, uh, who can tell stories through that medium the most of, most effectively. Uh, Adrian, uh, do you have a perspective on this, especially uh, since you're really uh, drilling into uh, the male uh, side of the coin and uh, just really looking at you know what are some of the behaviors that you're seeing and uh, from your perspective, uh, who will be the uh, you know the uh, influencers of the future? Yeah, the the way we see it is uh, for Trivers. Uh, the, the platform in itself has a very specific audience that it speaks to, and the content that we create is a very, very specific mission, uh, which is, this may sound controversial, everybody don't freak out, but it's to truly elevate the quality of life of male audiences worldwide for all the challenges that mainstream media has not addressed for many, many years. But in that, we have tons of content verticals, and the way we see creators being part of building out um, their stories, their content. And when we talk about content, we talk about multimodal content. So these platforms serve not only to, to sort of enhance our editorial point of view, but at the same time to have these amazing creators that you see, whether you know, in all video platforms or social media platforms, to really take their content creation and vision to the next level. So that being creating assets. Uh, imagining new rooms through generative AI integrated into virtual worlds, um, mul truly multimodal content, audio, podcast, you name it, basically everything really comes together in the metaverse in a way that today, if you want to consume content, uh, basically you have to you go to a video platform, you have to go to an audio-based platform, you have to go to a text-based platform, and so on and so forth. That fragmentation is all going to be basically um, sort of absorbed, if you will. It will be one place, regardless of the virtual environment, by the way, not just our platform, it could be other platforms. Yeah. So that's how we see the synergies, not only for for the actual uh, creators to, to be part of the editorial vision, right? Um, but at the same time, for them to be able to really, really expand and showcase what they're capable of doing. Um, and obviously, we guide them with also with uh, editorial vision. 
Dina, how can we cater to a lot of the uh, user behaviors uh, that will be, you know, uh, Gen Z we're already starting to see, uh, you know, a little bit on the millennial side, but uh, it's really uh, kind of honing in on the Gen Alpha and uh, future generations. How, do, how can brands ready themselves for this future and how can we really cater uh, to their needs? I mean, I think the best advice we can give any brand or any marketer is to participate in the ecosystems in which you're looking to engage audiences. Um, I think that there's nothing worse that brands than, than a brand that kind of swoops in and doesn't add value to the space in which they're activating. And that applies, by the way, to more quote unquote Web 2 spaces like TikTok, and it applies to more Web 3 and metaversal environments. Um, and so I think really, um, you know, tuning in, um, understanding sort of what the expectations are of a consumer or of a user on a particular platform, and really making sure that the way that you're animating your respective brand or product kind of distills down like to the essence of the brand, the emotion of the brand, as opposed to being super um, commercial in your endeavors. Vera. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, knowing your consumer, um, you know, yes, definitely, you know, test, you know, creatives with them, um, you know, immerse yourself ideally in your target audience, understand their hearts, minds, wishes and dreams and all that kind of fluffy stuff. But truly, like getting to know them as people and individuals, and I do think that will then uncover just other uh, and inform you know how you go about um, executing on your creative and in whatever experience it is it doesn't even have to be a metaverse experience so Kenneth well I think there are two things and Dina said something before about content creation that is very critical I mean without content creation the metaverse will not exist I mean you need content creation you need environments you need assets last year alone uh, enterprise invested or spent $64 billion in creating 3D content. That's only growing. And so uh, that will work very well for organizations creating their 3D content uh, and making sure that they can engage their audience, whether it's internal or their customers, in something that they can feel something. And that's very critical. How people engage is going to change. Today, people engage through a Zoom call or Google Meet when you cannot be face to face, and that's not really engaging. What the metaverse brings really is that level of engagement where you can feel you are with someone and you feel the brand around you, and that's going to make a difference. And uh, just to give you one example, we had one customer that after a three day event, eight hours a day in the platform, their chief marketing officer came to me and grabbed me, took me into a conference room and said, thank you for allowing me to be with my people for these three days. And I was like, I mean, he was kicked out of the platform 27 times in three days. He didn't mention that. I mean, people are not caring about the technology right now because they care about the experience. They care about engaging. And if I can send one message is that people engage in a 3D immersive world. That's why our kids, I mean, I asked my kid two years ago, not now, two years ago, what did you do last night? And he said, no, I spent time with John and Jimmy. And I said, what are you talking about? You were in your room. I was playing Fortnite with them but they think they are inside that place spending time with them. And yes, that sounds dangerous, but that's much better than many other things. I mean, they are actually engaging with people. And that's what the, the business world is bringing with the metaverse, is letting people engage in a meaningful way. Well said. Uh, Adrian, I want to, want to kind of zoom out a little bit and get into augmented reality. And uh, just to get your perspective on that, because you know when we talk about the metaverse, when we talk about VR and immersive technology, augmented reality is a huge component of that. And brands really are driving augmented reality and, and really the adoption of uh, where we're going to wear glasses that you know zoom over holograms. But are we going to live in a world where there's going to be ads uh, shooting right in front of us uh, at every moment and holograms everywhere <laughs> in the world. Is that, is that sort of the world that we want to live in? Or maybe, uh, you know, the future generations kind of want that? I, I, I think that that's going to happen. I know it sounds very scary, but it is happening. The evolution in how fast, um, for instance, devices are being developed especially when it comes to smart glasses. That's truly where we're going to see mixed reality, which is augmented reality and um, spe special uh, cl uh, cloud computing, right? Um, so 
It is happening. It's being built right now. But I think what is most important, kind of tie, tie back to that and tie back to, we talked about content, right? You, the way you want to look at uh, the future of devices as distribution of, of content that gets created for the metaverse, right? So not only you'll be able to consume content through your, your smart glasses, but at the same time, the same way we do that we all have in the smart TVs, we have all, millions of apps, right, that push out content. We're going to start seeing a lot of content being pushed out in exactly the same way that you, you know, you get in sports or the food channel or what have you, you're going to do that the smart glasses become another distribution channel for immersive experiences. Whatever those experiences you may pick and choose, whether it's an experience that you're walking down the street or, or basically at your home or whatever that may be. Um, so yes, we are in the future. It is happening. If you guys watched uh, Meta Connect's uh, uh, conference recently, it is very clear the direction which I think that this sort of what's happening, the intersection of AI, immersive technologies, and what have you, is really now starting to shape and define the idea of the thing so-called the metaverse. I think it now is coming into, into focus. Yeah. Just to add on that, I, um, I do think it will depend on the business model, of course, you know, and, you know, we could maybe eventually have a free headset, but then it will be ad supported or conversely a very expensive headset with no advertising. It kind of just depends on the business model. And then if there are going to be business models and platform and providers and, and device owners that are going to go for an ad supported uh, business model, of course, I do hope that it's going to be um, integrated and personalized ultimately for the consumer. You know, delivering you ads that the, the algorithm thinks you're gonna be more interested in and doing it in a more seamless kind of product integration type of way instead of like a very just jarring kind of ad all of a sudden in your left, you know, eye or something like that, so. And uh, Dino would love to get your perspective on this, uh, especially as, uh, you know, your past uh, at NARS uh, Cosmetics, and you know, you see a lot of uh, use cases around yeah. practical use cases. We're trying on makeup, and and uh, you know, before you actually spend a hundred dollars on that eyeliner, you're actually going to see how it looks on you, and and match it with uh, various outfits, um, you know, jewelry as well, and then being able to see uh, you know furniture items in your house. Um, how are you uh, hoping this uh, this augmented reality future will shape up? Well, I think that there's different ways to use augmented reality as a brand and as a marketer. I think that sort of the tried and true tactics in the beauty industry, which you mentioned, include VTO. And that's like a very established step in the consumer journey on, on any color cosmetics brand for the most part. Um, and it helps consumers kind of have, have confidence in the product that they're purchasing. Um, but then there's also the more experiential element, which obviously unlocks a lot of opportunities, whether it's through web AR, or mobile AR, or otherwise. Um, in terms of the experience, the story, the gamification, I mean, there are uh, countless things you can do with AR beyond sort of these like simple, straightforward, immersive filters. Um, I am curious to see sort of how the, the hardware conversation evolves. Um, I'm not a big believer in things like smart glasses. Um, I think that they make a lot of assumptions um, about consumer behavior that have, have yet to be proven. Um, I certainly don't want to wear a device like any that I've seen yet on my face every day. I might want to wear them for a particular event, for exactly. a concert, for a sporting event. I don't want to wear them 24 seven. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit of a skeptic on that, Dan. Yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so we've, we've got an audience question here. Uh, Dina, what do you wish Roblox had uh, that doesn't have today? I only have one minute and one second remaining. Um, no, I would say that I, I think Roblox, I, I'm a big believer in the platform, and I think that their team is doing a great job of um, hinting at what their, their roadmap looks like, and it is um, keeping both their users and participating brands top of mind and really, I think, walking that line in a very thoughtful way. I think there are some simple, straightforward things that would be great, like if you could deep link to an experience, which is currently not possible. Um, and then given that I also work with some color cosmetics brands, I would love to see us be able to offer more customization in terms of um, avatar faces, potentially faces that are more realistic. All right, very quickly, we only have 20 seconds left. Uh, so. Um, do all roads lead to the metaverse? Uh, I'll start with you, Dina. Yes, the metaverse is an inevitable evolution of the online experience. 
Shapira. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, it is the next iteration of the internet. That's it. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's, again, it's going to be the way we interact and engage when we're not face to face. And uh, we cannot replace what we have here today by no stretch. I mean, face to face, being able to engage one on one, it has no replacement. The question is, what do we do when we're not face to face? And the metaverse will bring, bridge that gap. And I think as we talked about, you know, in the in the back room earlier, um, it may not end up being called the metaverse, you know, but right. we do, I think, all agree that there will be something more immersive, experiential, you know, um, that's coming. And there we have it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank it you. It was an honor to be uh, on stage with all of you, and uh, thank you all for joining thank us. You. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone.